to today's episode of Health Tree Podcast for Multiple Myeloma, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. Now, before we get started with today's show, I have a very big announcement about a new product called Health Tree Connect. Health Tree Connect is a brand new social media platform that's part of the Health Tree suite of patient tools. If you participate in the Health Tree community chapter events, the webinars, or even if you don't, you can now connect and chat with other myeloma patients in these Health Tree Connect groups. You can find Health Tree Connect by going to healthtree.org forward slash myeloma and clicking on apps and programs in the menu bar. It's quite similar to Facebook and function without all the other distractions. And if you've used our forums, our forums in the past, we're moving those forums over to this new platform. In Health Tree Connect, you can post questions or comments, comment or react to someone else's post, add photos or videos to a post. You can subscribe to certain groups, which will put those conversations into your personal feed. And you can also view the general feed. Um, you'll notice that more groups are coming, including those not linked to a particular chapter. For example, we'll be adding a younger patient group, additional geographic groups, and a group for patients without caregivers. And you'll find more groups over time. So in the future, we'll be adding Health Tree Connect as a phone app to make those conversations easier. And I'd just like to invite you to join Health Tree Connect. Now on to our show. Um, we continue to be excited to see many new products being developed for the Future Myeloma Clinic, and today's show is about one of those products called, and I'm going to mess this up, Dr. Brown, <laughs> Modacophus mm-hmm. Alpha, yes, which nice. is this kind of example. And with us today is Dr. Noah Baran of the John Thurer Cancer Center in Hackensack, New Jersey. So, Dr. Brown, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Jenny. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with all of you and to educate you uh, in some fashion regarding exciting new treatments and uh, immune-directed therapies for myeloma. Well, we're excited that they're coming, and mm-hmm. it seems it just seems like they're coming at a, a pretty rapid pace. But before we get started with the show, let me just introduce you. Um, Mm -hmm. Dr. Baran is an attending physician and assistant professor in in the Multiple Myeloma Division of the John Thurer Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center. Dr. Baran received the New Jersey Top Doctor Award in the last four years and was recognized as Doctor of the Year in 2015. She's deeply involved in myeloma clinical trials that are currently serving and is currently serving as principal investigator on 11 myeloma trials testing different drugs like ibertamide, selenoxor, daratumumab, PD-1 inhibitors, carfilzomib, and, and others, and, um, and is serving on additional clinical trials as sub-investigator. She's peer-reviewed over 50 publications, is a very a prolific speaker, and is on the editorial board of Frontiers in Immunolo- Immunology and Frontiers in Oncology for Plasma Cell Dyscrasias. She also serves with professional and academic activities at Hackensack that include being a member of the Protocol Review and Monitoring Committee, the Medical School Course Faculty, and the member of the Institutional Review Board for Hackensack. So, Dr. Brown, I think there are a lot of patients that don't know much about this new treatment. It's been in early phase one kind of clinical trials, and it targets CD38. So maybe we just kind of want to I think a lot of patients might be familiar with CD38 because that's the same target as daratumumab and isotuximab, but maybe you just want to start by talking about why CD38 is such an attractive target in multiple myeloma. Yeah, uh, those are really important uh, questions. I think that um, CD38, we all know, is a surface protein receptor that is present on a number of immune cells. Most commonly and most prolific, um, most prevalent is on plasma cells, both malignant and healthy. So almost all myeloma cells express a protein on their surface called CD38. CD38 is also present on healthy B cells and on red cells. Uh, So as much as we're happy that um, antibodies to CD38 target and kill myeloma cells, they also can cause side effects such as anemia, low white count, and that's uh, kind of the off-target effect. Now, the other um, effect that we see from daratumumab and isotuximab and other targets of CD38 is that not only do they have anti-myeloma effects, but they also have 
effects on neighboring immune cells, such as T cells and natural killer or NK cells. So there's both a cell-directed killing effect to the cancer cell and also an immune stimulatory effect. So they um, can recruit other immune cells, cause cytokines, which are immune proteins to be secreted, and kind of awaken the immune system to fight other myeloma cells in the vicinity. So uh, we've seen a lot of success, as you all know and have probably seen before, uh, with anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. The difference and what makes modafficust alpha unique is that not only does it bind CD38, and it does bind a different epitope, so patients uh, who may not respond to daratumumab or isatuximab anymore, this therapy can still work because it binds on a different area of the CD38 protein. So that's number one. That makes it unique. And the other unique part is that it consists of two molecules, not just the antibody that binds to CD38, but also it has an immune cytokine called interferon, which can uh, be introduced into the myeloma cell and activate the signaling inside the myeloma cell to die. And it can also indirectly and directly activate other immune cells. So I guess I will just say one thing unless you have a question sure. about interferon. No, no, I just want to explain interferon because I think in order to understand um, how this therapy works, and we'll call it MODA just for, um, it's certainly, That'd I don't know if that's good. what Takeda <laughs> wants, but for the purpose of this discussion and for ease, okay. um, we'll call it MODA. But the, the import, in order to understand how it works, we need to understand what interferon alpha is or interferon in general. So, Interferon is naturally secreted by the body's immune cells in response to a virus. And when you think of what happens to our body when we get the flu or when we get any other virus, even hepatitis C, is our body goes on fight mode and it starts to secrete all of these cytokines. And one of the most important one is interferon alpha 2b. And that cytokine makes you kind of fight and kill the virus and go into a mode where your immune system is activated. And that's why people may feel achy or exhausted with the virus. It's not because of the virus. It's because of your immune reaction to the virus. And so we were uh, initially, it was thought, well, if this molecule turns on the immune system to fight off viruses, why can't we use it to our advantage to fight cancer? And back in the 80s, interferon was actually used as a treatment for myeloma, and it was one of the few treatments mm-hmm. that we had. Interesting. And what happened? I, yeah, I so, read that there were you know, certain kinds of side effect profiles that were not exactly. that great, and I'm just wondering about the efficacy, too. How well did it work? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... There were a lot of trials that looked at it, both as single agent and also in combination with melphalan and other treatments. And remember, this was before we had IMIS, before we even had bortezomib or other proteasome inhibitors, so we didn't have too many options. And it worked. Mm -hmm. It, It worked in the lab. When it was tried on myeloma cells in the lab, you could see that it activated the immune system and fought and killed cancer cells, and it also worked when we used it in early clinical trials. But as you said, the side effects were very difficult to tolerate because, A, it caused a lot of anemia, very debilitating anemia, and also it caused those flu-like symptoms that we see with a virus. So patients always felt exhausted, like headaches, fever, Mm -hmm. myalgias or muscle aches, even dizziness and confusion, and even at worst, it could cause arrhythmias or heart um, palpitations. Now, they tried to kind of um, reduce those side effects with a different formulation of interferon called pegylated interferon, which is when it um, kind of stayed in the body longer but in lower doses and much more... um, not highs and lows, just a much more constant dosing. Um, But even that, even though it showed a a slight benefit in response, the side effects remained. And so as we started to develop newer agents for myeloma, specifically IMIDs, 
like thalidomide, lenalidomide, and pomalidomide, the interferon-based therapy started to die down and um, be used less and less, and the studies started to become futile. Hmm. Well, it makes sense that they would move on to proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulators and things like that if that was the case, because that's not very easy to live with as a myeloma patient. Um, exactly. How? Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I've read too that it at this that Moda is considered an immunocytokine. So can you explain just a little background about what that is? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a new term. You know, there's all kinds of new uh, terms that are coined, bites, you know, by specific T-cell engagers, ADCs, Mm -hmm. antibody drug conjugates. So we're really using the same basic principle, which is a monoclonal antibody. Now, the reason that it's called an immunocytokine is because it's the first immunotherapy-based antibody to introduce an actual cytokine into the CD38 positive cell. So it's very diff- cytokines are not generally stable. If you infuse them into a person, uh, they, they don't stick around long, and so it's difficult to utilize that form of treatment. So this is a very unique and interesting way of introducing a cytokine into a directly into a myeloma cell. And that's where you get that term immuno and that means monoclonal antibody uh directed therapy and then the cytokine part refers to the interferon alpha 2b molecule itself. Okay, that makes sense. And really Um, what it's doing is very uh specific to the myeloma cell. So you're not going to get all those off-target effects, right, that you see with regular interferon or pegylated interferon. You're not going to see that it affect the whole entire body. You're going to see it specifically affect those myeloma cells, those CD38 cells. So it's really unique and exciting in that fashion. And can you cover a little bit more about how it is completely different from isotuximab or daratumumab in terms of, because you're mentioning, you know, it is, this is what's confusing, I think, for patients. It is mm-hmm. considered, this MODA, a monoclonal antibody, but um, then you're incorporating the interferon piece, and I think I just need a little more explanation, or maybe I just need to hear it multiple times <laughs> mm-hmm. for it to sink in about how it's different. I think that's always helpful. Yeah, so it's um it it targets a different part of the CD38 molecule, so it can get into the cells in a much different way. And actually, we see that when somebody's had a long time of daratumumab or isotuximab, they start to downregulate, meaning um the CD38 receptor. So those surface proteins on the myeloma cell start to hide. Once you've used the dara or the ESA for a long period of time. And so it's hard. That's why patients become resistant to those drugs because now the drugs can't get into the cell or the cell can kind of hide from the daratumumab or the isotuximab. So this molecule is unique. It binds a different portion of the surface CD38. So it kind of finds a new way to get in, even using the same receptor, and then it's a little bit sneaky, it injects that cytokine directly into the cell. So the ESA and the DARA don't have the interferon component. Um, And so, you know, this has the potential of kind of restoring response or um, working in patients who have already failed daratumumab or isotuximab. And the studies uh, will show that as well. I mean, the studies that have... Um, so far been presented, the early studies that are phase one and two uh, of MODA are actually showing that even patients who have failed DARA or ESA can respond to this treatment. This treatment can still work. So that really proves the point that it is different than just the what we call naked CD38 monoclonal antibodies. Mm-hmm. And that's remarkable for patients because there are a lot yeah. of patients so by the time they failed a proteasome inhibitor and a immunomodulatory drug and then the, the monoclonal antibodies, the CD38, then they're starting to look at other options like CAR-T or bispecifics or things like that. So um, this gives them a whole new option, which is fantastic. 
Um, can you yeah. talk about NK cell function? I know you mentioned at the beginning of the show that uh, daratumumab and isotuximab might affect NK cell function and kind of make you know reduce the the number of NK cells or the efficacy of the NK cells. But do you want to speak to that? Um, what are maybe just a little explanation? Yeah. What are natural killer cells? How do they work? And then how are they affected by the CD38 monoclonal antibodies? And then by this? Yeah. So. Natural killer cells are very, very important cells of the immune systems. They're lymphocytes, which is the same family as your B cells and your T cells, so they come from the same precursor or baby stem cell. Um, they're part of what we call the innate immune system, so they really have the potential of uh, increasing your immune response against any foreign, anything foreign, a virus, a bacteria, a cancer. And what they do is they kind of um, push out little granules or enzymes that can kill tumor cells or even kill viral cells. So they're extremely important in terms of um, myeloma response to therapy. They're, they've been shown even to correlate with improved survival. So patients who have healthy natural killer cells do much better in the long term. And we know that every time you get treatment for myeloma, we're depleting those NK cells. It's not just, you know, part of it is the treatment we're using, but also it's the disease itself. The myeloma itself likes to reduce the natural killer cells, both their function and their quantity in your, in your body. We don't exactly know why or all the specific mechanisms, but we know that, you know, we do deplete the NK cells with time. Now, we know that certain do treatments the N- rely, yeah, go ahead. But do the NK cells ever come back with function, you know, like that you can drop it down, and it's it's kind of similar to the idea of this T cell exhaustion idea, but can mm-hmm. you recover them over time? Absolutely, stop therapy absolutely. Or, okay. Yeah, absolutely, and we see okay. that with deepening of response, with long-time remission duration, those NK cells can return to normal you know, or at least close to normal functioning. In some people, they don't recover, but in many people, they do. And there are a lot of different treatments that rely on those NK cells. And that's why we're now a lot of the trials are looking at using those specific treatments earlier um, in relapse, not waiting until fourth or fifth line relapse when those NK cells are depleted. I think that's the complexity of immunotherapies because it seems like all of these different immunotherapies, CAR T's, bispecifics, vaccines, they, um, this, monoclonal antibodies, you know, they're all more effective potentially up front when you have a better shot at having a functional immune system. And yeah. then that's the, the, also the blessing and the challenge. Like, what do you use when, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. That is the question. And if you ask 10 different myeloma doctors, that question, you will get 12 different answers because Mm -hmm. nobody really knows. And, you know, the problem is there's no comparison of what to use when. Uh, For example, you know, there's studies showing that daratumumab in the upfront setting in combination with bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dex have remarkable responses. But it's never been compared to a triplet you know, head-to-head. It's never been compared to VRD or KRD. So, you know, even though it looks like it's really, really effective, we really don't have the long-term data to tell us if, you know, using a CD38 antibody in the upfront setting is really going to help you in the long run. And, you know, these therapies do have other side effects like depleting your healthy lymphocytes and kind of affecting in a negative way your immune system early on. And I think those questions really are yet to be answered. And we need to do more studies that are looking at regimens and comparing them head to head. Well, I agree. So we attended the International Myeloma Society meeting um, in, a, in Los Angeles last summer. And that was one of the big presentations, right? It was the Griffin study readout and talking exactly. about DARA uh, yeah. and K- VRD, I think, versus VRD. Mm-hmm. And um, so we went back and pulled some data because there was a debate, you know, during that meeting about are we do we need to run a phase three trial and really see what's happening? 
So we mm-hmm. came back and ran some of our health tree data against it, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. we'll, we'll be publishing on that. So I think the more, I think you're right. With all these different combinations, now you have this exponential number of treatment combinations that you're trying to compare, and there's just not enough time to mm-hmm. run all the trials to compare all the things in, in all the yeah. combinations. That's the challenge now. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And and the yeah. drug companies don't want to do it because what are they going to gain out of it? They're expensive trials, and they're not in it mm-hmm. to you know prove inferiority or reduce their right. patient you know population. Right. So. Can you also talk about how this new drug is administered? Like, is it an IV? Is it an oral medication? How often is it given? Um, yeah. For how long do you take it? Things like that. Yeah, it's given IV. Um, the dose right now hasn't been exactly finalized, but I can tell you that. And the phase one trials look at um, what is the correct dose. So the earlier phase one studies were dosing it weekly. Then every and they were seeing a lot of side effects, um, specifically low blood counts, low platelet counts. Um, some skin rashes, but really it was the blood counts that were really low. Then they went to every two weeks and finally every four weeks. And it looks like the efficacy it was excellent. At four weeks, it still had really, it was working, and also it was much more tolerable. They they didn't have to hold the dose or delay the dose. So it looks like it's going to be on a weekly basis, I mean a monthly basis, every four weeks, IV. Mm-hmm. And the most recent study... Um, and the way they determine is they look for something called maximum tolerated dose, which is kind of like when there's too many side effects to go on, they have to go down on the dose. So it's probably going to be a Mm -hmm. fixed dose. It's not going to be a weight-based dosing. It's going to be IV, and they're looking at two different doses, 120 and 240 milligrams, at least for single agent. Once you start combining it, that that could totally change. But at least, you know, once a month seems like a reasonable frequency. Yeah, very reasonable. It's much yeah. better than once a week, that's for sure, from a, from a yeah. patient's standpoint. And then how long does the IV take to administer? Um, it's Certainly you have to give the pre-meds. Um, based on the, the studies, it takes um, not, you know, not more than an hour. But, again, that's still being worked out. So we'll see. They didn't have a lot yeah, of infusion okay. reactions. It was about um, 25 or two patients in the most recent study um, at the weekly dose had an infusion reaction, and it was not severe. So I think that infusion time may even become shorter. Yeah, and that's what's different, too, than there are two mabrizotuximab, right? So you have these longer initial doses, and then they kind of space it out over time. And yeah. I think that's what we saw as patients, too, for um, – and we'll talk about the approval process and, and things that you've learned maybe with the data. But I think it's so interesting. You know, they're trying to look at this as a single drug, but most of the time myeloma drugs are given in combination with other things. And you saw that with Blenrep, too, like, right? They tried it at a single and then started combining it with other things, and then were able to space out the frequency. So yeah, that will be exactly. interesting to see if they're able to do that as well. So yeah. you talked about the difference between daratumumab and isotuximab and this drug. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the ability for patients to use this drug um, after they relapse after those things, what you're seeing in the data right now, do you think that this drug will end up being a replacement choice? for either one of those drugs? I mean, maybe you just don't know yet. You don't have enough data, but that would be an interesting yeah. idea, too. Is it like a next-generation kind of tool, or do you, it's like just one more tool in the toolbox? I think until this disease is curable, we're talking about increasing our tools and increasing our, mm-hmm. I always call it a box of chocolates, our chocolates in the chocolate box. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there may be a role for it, earlier lines of therapy, especially, you know, the side effect profile, there's no real, you know, uh, toxicities that to me would be 
limiting in terms of giving it to a patient. For example, there isn't any severe cardiac events that we're seeing. There isn't a signal that's really, you know, wow, this is a dangerous therapy to give. It seems like at this uh, most recently found dose, uh, the therapy is well tolerated. So, you know, we need to have many therapies. I think that the CD38s are convenient um, in terms of dosing and administration, and I don't think they're going away anytime soon. But I do think it's very exciting that the response rate for MODA is the same in the people who did and did not have um, DARA or ESA. So that tells you that it can really rescue patients who have failed um, anti-CD38, which is a big deal. Not all drugs can do that. It's huge. No, yeah. it's huge. And, uh, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, wonderful. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about where it's at in the development process? I first – I heard about it a very long time ago, but I heard more mm -hmm. about it at last year's ASH. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe you just want to talk about some of the data that you've seen yeah. um, at yeah. last year's ASH and, and this year's ASH. I think this year's ASH is really um, the more – Recent data, more and more pa more patients mm -hmm. were enrolled compared to last year. Um, there were two really important studies this year at ASH that were presented. Um, one of them was about how it activates NK cells, and I think that's interesting. And that was more of a um, laboratory analysis um, because they took the serum of patients who were exposed, the blood of patients who were exposed to this, and they proved that NK cells were activated in the setting of this drug. Um, so, so that kind of proves your concept or, you know, proof of concept how it works. Um, I think the more clinically relevant study was um, the final results from the Phase 1-2 studies. Um, let me just shut this. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so um, the, the study was presented by Dan Vogel at ASH, and um, mm -hmm. it, it presented data from about uh, 30 patients who uh, received MODA at what we call the therapeutic dose or uh, the weekly, the monthly dose. So patients who were included in this study had at least three prior lines of therapy, so they were uh, fairly heavily pretreated. Um, they had to be refractory meaning they've already exhausted a proteasome inhibitor and an IMID. And um, the study basically treated patients until progression of disease. So this was not a study that, sto um, that stopped, like a fixed duration study that um, other studies are now doing. This was a treatment until progression. So um, the patients showed... Um, so they 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 focused on the for the analysis they focused on the patients that were actually treated at the therapeutic dose. More patients were enrolled, about 100 received drug, but most of them were in the dose escalation phase. So they really received suboptimal dose or not enough drug to really make um an a, a statement about efficacy. So among the 30 patients who received the therapeutic dose, the overall response rate was 43%. And just mm -hmm. for historical um, purposes, so we understand the context, and this is now changing this, uh, the standard or what the expectation is, but in prior studies that looked at patients who failed three prior lines, including a proteasome inhibitor and an IMID and a CD38 antibody, so um, most of the patients who were on this trial did fail a CD38 antibody as well, and in those mm -hmm. patients, we kind of expect a 30% response rate. And that's how other therapies in this space have been approved. For example, Selenexor was approved in a similar patient population um, with an overall response rate around 30% as a single agent. Um, so this is a, a very a good overall response rate. Now, I think teclistimab is going to change, which is the BCMA by specific T cell engager may change that bar because we're seeing response mm -hmm. rates around 60%. So again, you cannot compare 
trial to trial. And in fact, these patients, a, a subset of them already failed BCMA therapy. So I would argue these are even more refractory patients. So I think overall response rate of 43% is very, very good. And that means that 43% of patients had a response of a PR or better, or a 50% reduction in their tumor burden or more. And the median time to response is 1.2 months, so it it works pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, The median progression-free survival, which is kind of a reflection of the duration of response, was 5.7 months. And then the side effect profile was what we would kind of expect with treatments in this setting. So most had low white count, including neutropenia. Most had a low platelet count. Um, Infection was seen in about 10%. They were severe infections, which, again, is fairly common in myeloma patients receiving therapy in the third line or or greater. Um, I think, you know, this is still a very small number of patients. Uh, It's not a long follow-up, so the data is going to change. The number is going to change. And I think what's more important is looking at kind of the patients who already had an anti-BCMA therapy. So that includes, at the time of the study, belantamab, CAR Mm T-cells, and possibly a bispecific T-cell engager because teclistimab and other ones, um, and another one, Regeneron has one too, were already in clinical trials. So I think in patients who already had anti-BCMA therapy, the overall response rate was 27%. Again, it's a small number of patients. We can't take this, um, you know, these numbers will change with time, but certainly this is very promising. And um, for just a single agent, we're happy um, with these results. And we think it has potential, especially when combined with other agents. Yeah, and can we talk about that for a minute? I like read this yeah. idea of resetting the bar because I think the FDA is starting to to do that a little bit, but I don't know like from a patient standpoint if they really should or not. Because like you look at you mentioned a few like Selenex or I think carfilzomib was approved like that. I think even daratumumab, yeah. I don't I can't Tomalidomide. remember what that is, but those Yeah, yeah they were they were all yeah. kind of in that 30 35 mm-hmm. Correct. Percent kind of response rates. And then they were combined mm-hmm. with other things. Like even teclistimab just had data that came out showing like it was in the 60s, low 60s or something, and then it was combined with other things, and it was almost 95% yeah. overall response rates. So yeah. I don't I, – you know, it kind of concerns me as a patient to mm-hmm. to have this higher, you know, 60% yeah. bar, and then everything has to meet that bar that's being developed because once yeah. you fail that, like – you know, then you're out of options. So it doesn't make sense to say to quash everything else and hold it to that higher standard. So I don't know. Just no, you're absolutely right. I, I agree think about 100%. that. Yeah, and I think that, you know, hopefully the FDA is not going to also only look at response rate, but it's also about toxicity. So, for example, mm-hmm. teclistimab really depletes your immune cells, and patients can have significant infections, viral infections. They may have prolonged COVID, prolonged even power influenza, recurrent pneumonias. And this is not, you know, that was in a a large subset of patients. Forty percent of patients had infections that were, you know, meaningful. So I think the FDA is also looking at that. So you don't necessarily want to expose somebody to this risk of infection early on in the disease course. You want to kind of give them a chance to respond to other therapies At least that's my opinion. And, you know, before Mm -hmm. you start introducing, even though it may have a higher response rate, um, the patient is likely to respond to almost anything in the early lines of therapy. So you really want to optimize quality of life at that time. And you want to give them something that's going to work, but also that's not going to debilitate them or put them in the hospital every other week. And I think the FDA is looking at the big picture. So... I think, um, you know, right now I'm not concerned that the FDA is going to, you know, not approve therapies based on a response, you know, that are less than a 60% response rate. I think that's an unreasonable expectation. And you can also see with the CAR T-cell data, you know, even though that therapy was approved based on a very high response rate in relapse refractory, like 90% almost, um, Mm -hmm. the FDA still... 
approved other therapies after that, which had much lower response rates. So that's an example that speaks to looking at the big picture. Yeah, I agree. Well, having everything on the table as a patient is so important because you just never know what you're going to need and when you're going to need it and what in what line of therapy, you know. You um, want to have options, maybe we of can, course. Yeah, oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. yes, you just never know. And people respond I mean, differently. I have patients and, who, mm-hmm, go, ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, I have patients, even when they're doing really well and they're in remission, and, they're you know, they're always saying to me, well, what's, you know, what's next? Let her, you know, what are my options moving forward if this stops working? And you always want to have that, you know, that knowledge that there's something next. And, you know, for now I can still say that to almost everybody. Mm-hmm. Well, absolutely. Hmm. Well, let's talk for a minute about what it's in clinical trials with currently because I think it's really fun to watch clinical trial design change a little bit in my opinion, um, I'm seeing changes with multiple arms all at the same time exactly. because you're trying to, the the company is mm-hmm. trying to figure out how does this mm-hmm. work best and in what combination. And so, do you want to go over how it's being tested now in clinical trials? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you know the reason we use daratumumab in every single line of therapy and in every combination is because the company that makes it put trials out all at the same time, all different arms in all different settings, and then, you know, Mm -hmm. you see what sticks and what works, and then, you know, doctors are more likely to use it, even if it doesn't have that indication in the NCCN guidelines. um, Once you have a study supporting that combination, that's going to be, that combination is going to be used. So it's really to the benefit of the patients, the doctors, and the drug company to, to diversify their portfolio of trials. Now, that's not always feasible because it's expensive um, to to run trials. So I did a search of Modacafusp in the clinicaltrials.gov, and I came across a number of trials. Um, most They're all still in phase one and two, so we, we're not yet at mm-hmm. the registration phase three trial. Um, the I see a number of single agent. There's one in combination with daratumumab in patients with relapsed or refractory myeloma, and I think that's a great partner because whenever you want to find a combination, you don't want overlapping toxicities. So the side effect profile of dara doesn't seem to interact with the side effect profile of MODA. Another trial is looking at MODA in solid tumors with Pembrolizumab, and in fact, I think Pembrolizumab is a checkpoint inhibitor. It blocks PD-1, PD-L1 interaction, and that's another way mm-hmm. to kind of wake up the T cells, wake up the NK cells, um, stimulate immune response. So I think that's a great partner, and I actually um, wanted to do that in myeloma. I uh, I think that would be a great um, combination in patients with multiple myeloma. So that's one. Can I ask I about that if... before before you yeah. go on? Mm-hmm. Cuz I know um these checkpoint inhibitors kind of um well, when they were combined with the immunomodulatory drugs, there were not good outcomes there. Right. And so what has your been experience been in kind of bringing them back to the myeloma clinic because maybe in a new combination that would be a wonderful, you know, treatment option. Yeah, I think it's a shame that the checkpoint inhibitors were handled in the way that they were. And I think there's a lot of evidence now showing that when, you know, when those trials were shut down, there were a number of trials with pembrolizumab, which is Merck's PD-1 inhibitor, mm-hmm. in combination with lenalidomide and in combination with pomalidomide, both in the upfront and the relapse setting. And initially, the phase one and two looked good. But later, when it started to become randomized, there were more deaths on the pembro imid arm. And mm-hmm. nobody could understand a pattern of deaths. It wasn't, it wasn't disease progression. Uh, and it, it looks like there was a lot of toxicity that was not managed appropriately. Because when you have checkpoint inhibitors, they can cause immune-mediated toxicity or reactions that are similar to autoimmune disease like colitis, endocrine disorders, fevers, 
cough that's not from pneumonia, that's from a pneumonitis or an inflammation. And there's actually mm-hmm. studies um, from those from those PEMBRO trials where you're looking just at um, patient cohorts from experienced investigators. For example, the Japanese data public the Japanese published their own data from those studies, and the the checkpoint inhibitor arms look great, and that speaks for um, you know putting these therapies in the hands of experienced investigators who have had experience with checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so a lot of the initial studies or the um, the ones that were shut down by the FDA were done not in the United States and not in countries where um, the doctors had experience managing these drugs. There are other studies published, mm-hmm. and one of them was here at Hackensack before the FDA shut it down um, using the combination of Pembrolen and Dex after an auto transplant, and uh, it, the, the results were really good. The, you know, it was a very small trial, but certainly we didn't see any immune-mediated toxicity. We saw uh, a much uh, longer progression-free survival in high-risk patients after an auto transplant. So I do not think that the checkpoint inhibitor story is over in myeloma. We've had, at least here, several discussions with the FDA about you know, uh, looking at these drugs and kind of being open to them, and it sounds like there is going to be a future for them. Of course, the FDA wants you to do these trials in more advanced myeloma patients because they don't want to risk toxicity to patients that have a lot of good standard of care options. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Can mm-hmm. you also explain when you say a phase one, two study, how do they break that out? Because phase one is usually safety, phase two is you know, well, well, you can describe it better than yeah. yeah. Um, so phase one is asking, adult but finding. When they combine it, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So what a lot of studies are doing is kind of a phase one B slash two. So that means that you're looking not only at safety but also at efficacy. So what they do is maybe a dose escalation. That's the phase one. So they started a really, really small dose, and they calculate that dose based on you know, mouse models. So they test the drug in animals first, and then they see what's safe in an animal, and they have a formula to calculate what would be safe in a human, and then they reduce that dose even more, and they look at how that dose affects the organs, um, and they do something called pharmacokinetic studies and pharmacodynamic studies, and looking at the drug and how it affects the body. And then if, like, for example, they'll dose three patients at a baby dose. If those patients don't have side effects, they go up on the dose. They go up to a second dose level and then a third dose level until um, they see toxicity. And they monitor patients very, very carefully. They do EKGs. They do frequent visits and blood tests to make sure, you know, the liver is okay, the kidneys are okay. And then that's the phase one portion. Once they reach a dose that is effective and that's safe, they start to do an expansion and they say, okay, now we're going to open it up to, let's say, another 45 or 50 or 60 patients at what's called the uh, RP2D or recommended phase two dose. And that's where the phase two portion comes in. And then you can expand it and see how it, how effective it is in a much larger uh, cohort of patients. And almost all trials now Seems are like combining. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like it. It's cheaper probably and faster, yeah. I would yeah. think, to do it like that. Yeah, hmm. yeah, because then you're all, also, you, you already have about, your site. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. And you talked about the FDA kind of approving after like the phase three or the registrational type trials, and I I never had understand that that term till recently. But some drugs, it seems, have gotten earlier FDA approval. Like I think daratumumab was approved after phase two. Or things like that. Yeah. Do you see this being having to go through that whole process, or do you see opportunities for this to be have a faster approval? Yeah. So sometimes a drug company can apply for what's called uh, fast track expedited approval, mm-hmm. and in order to get that approval, and that approval is based on phase two trials, not on randomized phase three trials. You have to prove that. Number one, there's not options for the tr- the patient, so you have to have an unmet need, um, and you have to have kind of a rare disease. And you know, even though we have a lot of myeloma patients, it it, it is a rare disease. Um, so I think 
and also, you know, it's not a curable disease. So many of these drugs are getting approval, you know, fast track approval. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it forever. Look at belantamab, you know, and look at other mm-hmm. drugs that right. melflufen um that were approved initially based on the fast track conditional approval and then when the phase 3 studies came out they said nope, not good enough or benefit does not outweigh risk. Toxicity is too mm-hmm. high and benefit is too low. So I think we're seeing a lot more of that withdrawal um, of approval. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or no more data is needed or something. Exactly, more data yeah. is needed. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I know in Belantamab they're still, they haven't given up on the drug and the company is, you know, getting their data and doing their studies, hoping to get approval. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And um, I you I interrupted you when you were going through the different trials in the combinations that oh, it's yeah. being done yeah. in. Yeah. Um, so really just, I mean, that's the only combination partner that's ongoing, Pembro in solid tumors and DARA mm-hmm. in myeloma. The rest are just, uh, actually, I think there's another one that has a combination of lenalidomide and bortezomib. And that's a phase one trial with several arms. So in one trial, they're doing, um, they have many arms and different dose levels because you still don't know what the right dose is when you combine it with lenalidomide. You may need much less of the drug because that imid is going to maybe make the drug more effective or it may increase the rate of low white count. It may increase the rate of infection. So Whenever you do a combination, you have to start from scratch regarding dose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all these different combinations, that's a lot to try to figure out and to try to get enough patients into each arm so it's, like, statistically worthwhile so you get an answer. Yeah. I also saw one trial that was um, using it, well, in in one of the trials it looked like they had it open for doublets and then they had it open for triplets and then they were using it as maintenance therapy for newly diagnosed patients, which I thought was really interesting. Um, How would you see this being used as maintenance therapy? I think it's a great maintenance therapy because I think the idea behind maintenance um, and, and even maybe consolidation, maybe maintenance isn't going to be maintenance anymore. Maybe it's going to be just four months or six months of therapy and then stop and give people an actual break. And I think the field is headed toward toward that direction, um, you know, especially with all these new treatments. You know, what are we really doing by giving single-agent low-dose lenalidomide? What is it really doing in the long term? Um, so I think... Using this therapy in combination after transplant is a great idea because what you're doing is you're taking the myelo- the patient's myeloma, which is at the lowest probably it will be after a high dose of melphalan, and right when the immune system is recovering or resetting, and you're giving it a therapy that's going to reinvigorate your immune system at the time of the least amount of myeloma, there's a very high likelihood you're going to get, you know, durability, long-term remission because you're kind of training the immune system to keep the myeloma under check. So I really believe strongly in, you know, immunotherapy after transplant, Um, you know, and I think it would be reasonable to use it with an imid in that setting. Hopefully the trials are going to pan out. Yeah. Yeah, you, when you think about, like, go, sometimes patients can go back to that MGUS-like state or even just from, like, MGUS patients, I think what, you know, just I hear um, in talking to different investigators that it sounds like, you know, that escape outside of the immune system, keeping it in check is what yeah. causes the progression. And so if there are these immune adjuvants, I guess, that kind of, spike that immune system or kind of ramp it up to recognize and then control the myeloma, that would be ideal. And maybe you double your remission times between therapies or something. Yeah, I think that's really the way to go. I think that's the future of myeloma. I think we're going to be doing fixed-duration therapy 
you know, in the up the upfront setting is the most important, and then after transplant for those of uh, for those patients who are eligible for transplant, you know, rebooting the immune system and teaching it how to control the myeloma and putting it back into an MGUS state. I think you're absolutely right, and we do see that with patients. I mean, we see patients quite often who are in remission, you know, with a small M spike. 0.2, 0.3, no MRD negativity, just small burden of disease for mm-hmm. a decade. So it's certainly possible. And, you know, those are the patients we need to study and say, what's going on with your immune system? How are you doing this? You know, when you, <laughs> yeah. you know, and these are patients who had real myeloma, who had lytic lesions, who had kidney problems, and now all of a sudden they're MGUS. Yeah, I have friends like that. The transplant didn't yeah. work, but maybe a single drug <laughs> did, and they have this constant yeah. M protein, but it's just consistent yeah. over, yeah, like you said, a decade. Yeah. So totally fascinating how this, mm-hmm. um, how these drugs are coming, you know, just the combinations and how they work are so different. It's just so shocking to have, like, another CD38 targeted drug and then have it be so completely different from the two that are already in the space. So it's yeah. exciting for patients to see that because you wonder how many more targets you can actually find, right? We have BCMA and we have CD38, but, um, you know, mm-hmm. maybe there aren't 15 more targets to go after. I don't know. I'm sure there are much more than that. We just have to find them and be patient right. and keep doing what we're doing and, you know. Yeah. Patients help trigger and make the doctors move faster and make the scientists move faster. So we all have a role in this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And there's a lot that patients can do. So um, yeah. I want to open it up for caller questions. So yeah. if you have a question for Dr. Brun, you can call 347-637-2631 and then press 1 on your keypad. And uh, we will start with caller ending in 9153. Um, Go ahead with your question. And sorry, it's taking a second to bring them on. Okay, go ahead with your question. Oh, maybe they pushed the button. I didn't mean to. Okay, caller at 9569. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, My question is, are they doing anything with the high risk or non-secretory in the clinical trials? And um, then this MODA, do they still give you dexamethasone? And do you continue with I'm on Delcade and Daratumumab and Revlimab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. So um, the first part of your question speaks to the patients who are high risk and non-secretory. I think there is right now a big focus on high risk. Um, most studies are actually requiring a certain subset of patients who are enrolled to have high risk uh, cytogenetics. And the definition of high risk is changing, so we're learning about, you know, different mutations, um, next generation sequencing, and different ways to characterize high risk. I think in terms of non-secretory myeloma, it's a different story. Um, we have had trouble in our practice getting patients with non-secretory myeloma on trials, um, and, you know, usually early phase trials will allow it. But later phase trials who are trying to get their drug FDA approved do not, and that's because it's much more difficult to know if the drug is working. It's not impossible. Um, You know, we can determine based on scans, based on biopsies. You know, some patients, unfortunately, have to get frequent bone marrow biopsies. But there are ways to determine response in non-sequitory myeloma. It's just that... In late stage trials, you know, their goal is to get a drug approved. So they don't want to often include these patients. I think in earlier trials, um, they are included. So that's the first part. And then the second part of your question was regarding dosing of the MODAC, of the MODA, and whether or not it's given with dexamethasone. Um, this drug 
was not. I believe it was not, but I'm going to check just to make sure I'm correct. Um, yes, it was uh, an activation, additional cohorts. Yes, some cohorts were with DEX and some were not. So it was looked at both with dexamethasone and without. And it looks like there still was efficacy in the cohorts that did not use dexamethasone. So that's good to know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks for your question. Okay, um, caller ending in 9569. Go ahead with your question. Hello? Hello? Hello. Yes, go ahead with your question. Oh, oh, it said 9529. Oh, maybe, maybe you... Okay. Um, oh, 9569, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I'm a recently, um, I guess you would say recently diagnosed, actually. I was diagnosed in um, April of last year. Um, I was on immunotherapy. I had three rounds of immunotherapy. I was in the kids um, the kids study, and then I had an autologous um, stem cell transplant. Um, I was told then in four months, so I'm kind of back to being able to go to work, but I was told that within four months um, there will be a second one, a second transplant. And I, as I was listening to the program, I heard Dr. Baran um, say mm -hmm. that she likes to do um, immunotherapy after the transplant. I'm currently in remission, so mm -hmm. after the second transplant, I'm kind of where you were saying, what next? What would I do yeah. next? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um you know, certainly there is an opportunity for what we would call consolidation therapy. I think it's going to depend on, you know, where your disease falls after the transplant, how your immune system recovers, and where your disease markers lie. So I think that's certainly a conversation to have um, when you're, you know, all done with transplant. And, um, you know, the clinical trial um, may in some way dictate, uh, you know, what you're getting, but I um, you know, we'll see. Okay. I think it's a great I'm question and a great discussion. Well, um, I'm actually at the John Thera Cancer Center. Yeah, I, I figured because you you told you said you're on KID, and that is an yeah. investigator-initiated study. I don't think anyone else has that except us. Oh, okay. Or um, Georgetown. So I figured, um, and yeah. Well, I was also going to want so is it. Is it that there are different, because it seems like there's just so many different treatments. Is it kind of yeah. based on where the patient is or? Yeah, I, I think guess. it's based, yeah, it's based, it's it's patient by patient, and it really depends on how deep the remission goes, how you tolerate the treatment, and, um, you know, what your, your initial fish and cytogenetics are and what your risk of progression is. So I think it's an individualized discussion, but it's important to know that there's many, many options. And, um, you know, what you don't get at consolidation, you can always get at relapse. So it's also about the timing. Okay. Okay. I was just wondering because there was just Thanks so many. Coming. I was just hoping I could the right one. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much. Okay, we have two more mm -hmm. questions, if you don't mind. Um, caller in 9153. Go ahead with your question. Oh, can you hear us? Caller 9153. Okay, I will uh, no. jump. To oh, there we go. Hi, yes, thank you for... Uh, oh, so sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Now you're unmuted. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. We're not. Uh, okay, go can ahead. Can you hear me sorry. all right? Start over with your question. Yes, now we can. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think you left me uh, unmuted, and, and that's what started it. Uh, yeah, thank okay. you so much for <laughs> a real wonderful talk today and I, I really enjoyed it. I had a question about 
this has an immunotherapy that activates the immune system and natural killer cell function. But there's also other drugs that do this too. So how do you feel about any anticipated side effects and issues when you combine multiple immunotherapies for a patient? I think they all are unique, and I think they all have their own side effect profiles. So as long as there's no overlapping toxicities, um, I think it's a good, you know, approach. There's all there's data, uh, for example, um, on um, DARA in combination with, um, imi- you know, DARA and IMIDS. There's combination uh, on other immune, med- you know, ELO, for example, is a NK cell stimulator with IMIDS. So uh, as long as it's safe and there's no overlapping toxicities, I think it's a very effective approach. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for the question. It is confusing to see all these different immunotherapy approaches and like with CAR T and by specifics and and everything. Everything works in a different way. So, and our last question, I can't tell what your phone number is, so go ahead Hello? with your question. Mhm. We can Hello? hear you. Hello. Yep, Hello? we can hear you. Hmm. How's it going? Good. How are you? So, how are you doing overall? Oh, well, okay. Um, I think we'll just end the show, Dr. Brown. We're thankful that you participated. We're so thankful that you're doing all the work that you are doing in myeloma. And um, we're just so grateful for you as patients that you're working on things like this to move them forward. Thank you for having me, and and, uh, I wish everyone the best. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to our listeners for listening to the Health Tree Podcast. Join us next time to learn more about what's happening in myeloma research and what it means for you. Bye-bye. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.